Science Bubble is a long-time partnership that Berkeley Public Library has run. Um, it's a monthly seminar series that aims to share new research findings from grad students and postdocs at UC Berkeley with the general public and create constructive discussion about a variety of science topics. Um, we have two speakers <coughs> at each seminar who will talk about their current research or a topic that they find really interesting. The organizers are for graduate students at UC Berkeley, um, Kayla Gong, Daniel Brett Howard, Madison Lemer, and Oksana Andre. The lectures happen on the third Tuesday of the month at 5.30 p.m. Um, the programs are archived on the Science Bubble YouTube page, so feel free to um, check out our collection and share them with people you know. Um, Popping the Science Bubble also has a website and a listserv that you can join to learn about upcoming topics. So thank you so much. I'll let Daniel introduce the speaker tonight. Um, so thank you very much for being here tonight. Uh, we're very excited for our two speakers. Um, so, as Kelsey mentioned, we host a uh, research talk on the, on the third Tuesday of every month, uh, and we have researchers from a wide variety of departments to share their interesting research with all of you. Um, we'll be showing QR code at the very end of the uh, presentation today to, if you would like, wish to sign up for any of our uh, listservs or anything like that, or you can use bit.ly slash PTSD emails in order to join. Um, we also have Twitter, we have Facebook as well, um, and all of our previous presentations are on YouTube. Um, so for tonight, we have uh, Kelsey Petratus and we have Carol Bombauer um, giving us presentations. And so this is an open format talk, uh, so we encourage questions throughout the presentation, and you can submit your questions if you are on Zoom through the chat, and we will read them for you. Um, and there will also be time after each talk for questions as well. And so to start us off, uh, we have uh, Kelsey DeFreitas. And Kelsey grew up in New Jersey and earned her BS in biomedical engineering from Rome University in 2018. She then went on to pursue her PhD in bioengineering at Berkeley. And there she worked with Professor Phil Messer-Smith Messer -Smith, <laughs> excuse me, uh, to develop new therapeutics for inflammatory bowel disease. After completing her PhD in May of 2023, Kelsey is now conducting postdoctoral research with Professor Christian Hernandez at UCSF. She is working to understand how bacteria sense and respond to physical stress with the hopes of creating new materials that use bacteria to repair damage. So Kelsey, please take it away. Yeah, and thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so I'm really excited to be here today and share my work about engineered living materials. Um, so as you will learn throughout my presentation, this is a new type of composite material that is inspired by nature in that it consists of both a living and non-living component. And by the end of my talk, I hope to convince you that engineered living materials or ELMs as we sometimes call them are really the future for medical therapeutics as well as sustainable building supplies. Uh, but to begin, uh, I'd like us to just start by trying to think about what types of material are available to us today. Um, as we look around this room, uh, we will probably see that everything from our consumer goods to our homes and skyscrapers are made from synthetic materials like plastic, glass, steel, and concrete. Uh, and all of these materials have been engineered for their mechanical robustness. Uh, low cost and modularity. But using so much of these types of supplies has come at a significant cost. Today, over 25% of global carbon emissions come from materials manufacturing. And over the last six decades, they have come to fill our landfills. And even today, we're generating 290 million more tons of waste per year. And this is because a lot of these materials are prone to wear and degradation and damage, and we have to always continuously replace or repair, update, and renovate the structures that they form. And over the next decade, these types of repairs are estimated to cost up to $3 trillion in the U.S. So to reduce this economic and environmental burden and keep up with the demands of our growing society, we really need to rethink how we're creating and constructing the elements of our built world. But we're in luck because around us, there are already a variety of strong, sustainable materials uh, that have been built by nature. 
So biological materials such as plants and animal tissue require uh, very simple forms of energy to grow and form such as sunlight or chemical nutrients. And the, what's truly amazing about them is that a lot of these processes are dynamic and they don't stop once the material is created. Long into uh, their lifetime, they're still able to change and adapt to their environment and change their chemical and physical properties. This allows them to heal and repair damage, produce completely new elements through regeneration, or grow and adapt to changing environmental conditions. And these actions significantly increase the service lifetime of these materials, allowing structures to exist for thousands of years. So you're probably wondering how these uh, structures do this. Uh, and this is through the action of living cells that are embedded throughout the natural materials. These cells can send signals from the environment and execute pre-programmed functions that they have uh, to remodel and change their small micro environment around them. And those small changes lead to substantial changes in the actual uh, whole material. But they uh, don't, they're not the only thing that's making up these biological tissues and materials. Uh, there's also a non-living component, often called the extracellular matrix, that supports and protects cells and gives them the necessary nutrients and mechanisms of waste uh, disposal that they need to survive. So inspired by this architecture, engineers like me have recently been interested in seeing if we could try to design our own type of hybrid structures that combine living cells uh, with some of our conventional man-made materials that we've already been using. And we call these materials engineered living materials. So to create this new technology, we take simple organisms such as bacteria, fungi, plants, or individual animal cells and add them to a variety of different non-living materials. These non-living materials are meant to perform the same functions as a natural extracellular matrix, giving a structure for the cells to grow in, protecting them, and giving them everything they need to support their life. We can also design the synthetic components to meet the demands of a specific application. For example, making the matrix extra strong to support weight so that it can be used to build structures and homes. By doing so, we hope to create materials that have designer properties and that can be processed and used to create different things like our conventional synthetic materials while preserving a lot of the functions of the living component in the cell in order to create materials that perform those same things as the natural materials such as growth, uh, response to environment and repair. So as you can see, there are a lot of different ingredients we can use to make engineered living materials. Uh, but we are, and a lot of the field is primarily interested in using bacteria to create elms. So bacteria are single-celled organisms that we have been studying for a long time as just a model of more complex life or leveraging in the lab actually as mini biofactories. We think that they are a great ingredient in uh, elms because they're already adapted to grow in very diverse environments. There's been reports of some strains surviving in extreme conditions such as really high temperature and pressure. Um, they also naturally produce materials on their own. Uh, you've probably encountered some of these materials, everything from the dental plaque that forms on your teeth or that gross stuff that floats in the kombucha. Those are all products that are produced by bacteria. And they form these products after they sense a variety of different external signal signals such as light, acidity, mechanical force, and temperature. And with new tools coming out in genetic engineering, we can actually create bacteria that do new functions and respond to things that they would not normally find in nature, such as disease biomarkers, or uh, we can design them to do new functions like uh, degrade plastic, say. 
Uh, so let me just show you some examples of what these uh, bacteria have already been able to, to do in the place of engineered living materials. So a few uh, years ago, researchers from UC Boulder mixed bacteria with sand, gelatin, and a food source, and then just waited for the bacteria to grow. So starting out with very simple building blocks. Over time, the cells naturally grew and began to produce a couple natural products just based on their metabolism. And one of these included a very strong mineral called calcium carbonate. Another product from the bacteria could then function as a sort of glue to bind the cells, the sand, the calcium carbonate, and the gelatin together to create a solid brick. And when they actually dried this brick, it was able to support the same amount of weight that normal cement or concrete could. And even though it was dried and the cells were in a kind of like a, a dormant state here, they found that if they damaged the brick and then added more food sources for the cells, the cells could either repair that damage or they could completely recycle the brick and create a new one. So today this technology has moved out of the laboratory and is used by a company called Prometheus Materials to produce these bio bricks, uh, believe it or not, using the same method. So this is kind of the power of academia meeting industry. You can see you would much more like your house to be built out of something like this than that brick shown before. Um, and although these materials have yet to be used in a full-scale project, uh, it represents a really important step towards the commercialization of ELMS um, and efforts to lower our carbon footprint in construction and manufacturing. So uh, within the next 20 years, I really foresee a, a boom in engineered living materials. There's already research going on to design EMLs that um, respond to diverse stimuli, such as light, temperature, different sorts of chemicals, and mechanical force, and perform some type of function that's ultimately going to make our lives easier. For example, there's been work done to create more sustainable bioplastics, or weather-resistant paint, paints, self-healing concrete, or photosynthetic coatings. And in addition to all of this work, there has also been so much going on in the medical community focused on trying to use engineered bacteria in elms as new living therapeutics and that can be used to diagnose and treat disease. And I think they may soon become a staple in your medicine cabinet. Uh, so for example, um, researchers at MIT have recently created an ingestible pill that houses bacteria that have been genetically engineered to glow when they come in contact with blood. Uh, they then basically put all these bacteria inside this pill, uh, also with an electronic sensor that can detect the light emitted and relay this information to an app on your phone. And they demonstrated in a couple animal models that they could use this technology to non-invasively detect gastrointestinal bleeds. There's also been a lot of research uh, trying to use bacteria as basically these mini uh, drug factories um, where they're already kind of like little robots equipped with their own motors, sensors, and instructions to produce potentially therapeutics. So there's been some work to try to design bacteria that are able to respond to chemicals that are found only in tumors, with the idea being that you could administer the bacteria and as they travel around their body and eventually come into contact with a malignant cell, this would trigger them to release the chemotherapeutic locally in that area. And this would be a huge advantage because it would limit any off-target effects that are often seen. So you're probably wondering specifically what I'm doing uh, in this space. Um, so my goal as a postdoc researcher in the Hernandez at lab at UCSF is to create engineered living materials that respond to mechanical forces, which could be caused by damage or by putting more pressure on or weight on some type of built structure. 
Um, so to do this, I'm first stepping, taking a step back and trying to understand how bacteria sense and respond to being physically pulled and squished. And this is something that's really hard to do because the cells are incredibly small, so less than one one thousandth the width of a human hair. Um, so in order to squeeze them in a very defined and controlled manner, our lab creates these devices that have these small channels that are actually smaller than the width of an individual bacteria. And we can flow bacteria through the channels and we use high pressure to wedge them further down into the device. And this will eventually compress the cell. And then we can compare these two cells in how they behave when we flow different nutrients or antibiotics through. Uh, we can also study which types of genes are upregulated here or general changes in cell morphology and behavior. And um, from what I showed you today, uh, it's really all this work is really only one small step towards the full development of engineered living materials. And we still have many challenges to overcome as a field. And today researchers are working hard to determine how we can, for example, design materials that retain microbes that don't allow their release into the local environment or protect cells within the materials from invasion from other organisms that may just be naturally around. We're also trying to think of new ways that we can assess um, material health and function over the course of its lifetime without having to just completely like crack open the material and look to see if the cells are healthy or not. And finally, I think something that's really important is that we try to develop ways that we can truly control the, the organism growth and development inside the engineered living materials. Develop something that's almost like an on and off switch, where maybe there's environmental stimuli that trigger growth um, or, or stop cells from dividing if things start to get out of hand. And in addition to all of these technical hurdles, uh, researchers are really starting to also work with politicians and regulators to try to understand how we can safely integrate these products into our daily life. And I was really excited to come here today uh, to talk, start to talk to you about how, as a society, we feel about engineered living materials and how we're going to interact with goods and, and homes and products that are now actually living. Because hopefully one day soon, we can live in a more sustainable world inspired and built by nature. Awesome. And I'll use some post privileges to ask one of my own. Um, so like for something like those bio bricks, the living materials yeah. bricks, um, like how often do you have to, I, I, and like, how do you, I guess, deliver food to all the cells? I imagine like, you know, the cells are maybe in the very center of the brick. It's difficult to get things there. Or maybe it's like, you have to like put an apple next to it every other day, or I don't, I don't know what, how, how does that work? Yeah, yeah, so it's really tough. So all of the engineered living materials that have been developed so far really only have shelf lives of a few days, uh, exactly, because the cells eventually run out of nutrients. Um, but something else we're working on in our lab is how we can design the material to provide these nutrients over time. Um, but you're totally right that, that it's a major challenge so far and not something that we have figured out. So this is super, super long term. Yes, yes, yeah. Well, the bio bricks are an established product. So those, they rely on the fact that when the cells are, are mostly dormant, after you basically dry the material, um, they kind of enter like a stress state where they're hibernating. So then if the material was damaged, that's when you would need the cells to be reactivated. So then you could add some sort of food source to them now. But creating an engineered living material that has alive cells all the time has proven pretty challenging. So what would you 
do with those bio bricks? Yeah. I mean, what could be a potential set? Yeah, so right now they're used to create some structures um, in the Chicago Museum of Architecture right now. They're in an exhibit. Um, and uh, they're, they're usable, but I think the major hurdle so far has been regulations on them and trying to figure out how we can safely use them and be part of it. But hopefully one day they could be used like normal bricks to, to build a house. Also, you know, so you're talking a little bit about how they like cells typically produce a lot of things like the dental plaque and all that. Yeah. Um, so like, are you able to like kind of tailor what these cells produce and make sure they don't produce anything that like might degrade the brick or something like that? Or Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so there's been a lot of like improvements in genetic engineering techniques. So it's made it super easy to modify the organisms to get them to do exactly what we want. But of, cur of course, that introduces a whole nother complication when it comes to regulation, because you certainly don't want some type of engineered organism to escape a material, right? Um, so most researchers have been trying to use just native natural bacteria strains. Um, and a lot of them have already been grown for so long in the laboratory that we can really like predict how, how they're going to be made. Then let's thank Kelsey one more time. Thank you. While Carol is switching on over. All right, so Carol is switching over. I'm going to go ahead and introduce. So Carol is an electrical engineer developing sensors for environmental science. Growing up in Montana gave Carol a love of the outdoors, especially hiking, biking, and skiing in the mountains and floating rivers. She grew up around plants and agricultural research, but decided to study electrical engineering in college at Montana State University. When she came to Berkeley for grad school, she found herself drawn back to her roots and stated, um, stated making sensors for agricultural and environmental monitoring. She's currently a postdoctoral researcher in the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department at UC Berkeley. Go ahead and take it away. And you could also share yep. your presentation. This could be scary. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, if you want to get rid of that bar up there, yeah. you can go to more yeah. and then hide floating controls. Awesome. Okay. See everyone. Thanks to everybody for coming and uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, let's get started. So here in California, we're all uh, quite familiar with the effects of climate change, uh, increased fires. This is a picture of the burned area from the Caldor fire a few years ago. And um, many of us have probably heard about global warming and greenhouse gases. And today I'd like to dive a little bit deeper into how that works, um, some different things about greenhouse gases, how we can measure them and where they're coming from. So, um, global warming uh, all starts with energy uh, and things that are hot emit light. So the sun is very hot and it emits light that we can see in the visible spectrum yellow. Um, and the color at which different things emit light depends on how hot they are. So something that's less hot, like coals in a fire, uh, emit red light. And you might not think of the earth as being hot. Um, but it's much hotter than the empty space around it. And it's also emitting light, um, but it's just light that we cannot see. It's in the infrared area, so it's even lower energy than red light. Um, so when we have the sunlight uh, hitting the Earth, that can easily come through the atmosphere because it's colored yellow isn't really absorbed by the atmosphere. That heats up the Earth. Um, and then the Earth is emitting the infrared light that we can't see. And most of that energy 
can escape out the atmosphere. Um, but some of it is absorbed by the gases in the atmosphere and reflected uh, back towards the Earth. So this is, you've probably heard the analogy of being like a blanket. So if you put a blanket on a chair or something that's not warmer than the uh, than its surroundings, nothing happens. It doesn't get warmer. If you put a blanket on your lap, which is warmer than everything around it, you start getting warmer because it traps the energy that your body is making. The same thing here. The Earth is, is much warmer than outer space. Um, so when we have a blanket of gases, uh, we trap more energy. And greenhouse gases are specifically those gases that can absorb and trap light of the color that the Earth is giving off. So it's not just any gas. It's specifically the ones that trap light that we give off. Um, you're probably very familiar with carbon dioxide that is talked about a lot um, because it is the majority of the gas of, uh, that's causing the problem. But there's also a lot of others that are starting to get more attention. So you may have also heard of uh, methane and some policy if you're really following climate change policy. Um, so, and then there's a third one that is even less well known than methane, which is nitrous oxide, which is what I'm studying. And um, what goes into how um, how much a gas contributes to global warming is partially its potency, which is how much heat does one molecule of gas trap. And so we normalize things to carbon dioxide being trapping one unit of heat per molecule of carbon dioxide. Methane is about 30 times more potent, and nitrous oxide is about 300 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So I guess it's kind of scary. <laughs> um, Um, the other, another thing that goes into it is how long they stick around in the atmosphere. And so methane, after about um, 12 years, any methane that we've emitted is usually converted into some other gas and is no longer actively trapping heat. Um, but nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide stick around for 100 years or more. And so that's part of why they're a problem. Uh, one good thing about nitrous oxide, and one of the reasons we have it heard about it so much is it's really dilute. It's only um, parts per billion. So carbon dioxide is about a thousand times more concentrated than nitrous oxide, which is good because if there was more of it, we'd have even more of a climate change problem. Um, for trying to study it, though, it makes it really challenging because it's like looking for um, less than 0.1 teaspoons of salt in a six-person hot tub. Um, it's pretty hard to see that much. So um, where is this coming from? And uh, nitrous oxide is, is part of the nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen is a key building block for all of life. We use it in proteins. We use it in DNA. Plants use it um, in their um, chlorophyll that they use to do photosynthesis. So it's really important for all kinds of life. And it's really, it, it forms different compounds in nature. And um, it's mediated by bacteria that live in the soil and other microorganisms that can change uh, the chemicals, chemical form of nitrogen. So it can be attached to different other atoms and form different molecules. And it's the microbes in the soil that help convert nitrogen in the air to nitrogen that plants can use to help break down nitrogen that's in um, like plant litter or decaying material and return that to the soil. All of that is being done by microbes. Um, and sometimes they don't do all their transformations exactly perfectly. So incomplete transformations between different kinds of uh, chemical forms of nitrogen in the, in the soil can give off nitrous oxide, which has the chemical symbol N2O. And so if something is a little bit inefficient, that's where uh, we can get some nitrous oxide. And in um, agricultural systems, people have really changed the balance of the nitrogen cycle by adding a lot of fertilizer to agricultural lands. And 
one of the main components of fertilizer is nitrogen, uh, often in the form of, in the form of uh, ammonium or nitrate. And so when we add, say, a lot of nitrate to the soil, we really change the balance of the environment that the microbes in the soil are living in, and that can cause them to produce uh, more nitrous oxide than they would have otherwise. So um, the nitrous oxide in the atmosphere, I meant to say earlier, um, about 40% of it is caused from human activity, and in that, the rest of it is caused from natural um, natural nitrogen cycling. It's always there. But the, the part that's caused by human activity, 80% of that comes from agriculture. And most of that is soil management um, that's driving the increase in nitrous oxide. Um, okay. So this is where it's coming from. How do we know how much there is? How do we know anything? about this gas. Um, I'd like to take a little like, aside anecdote um, because the answer for state-of-the-art measurement um, is that we do it with light. And I, when I was a kid, I had this question because um, I, I could see if I had a flashlight and I shined it in the mirror, it would reflect back on the back wall and there would be a second flashlight. So I, I was imagining what if I had a box that was full of mirrors. And I shine a flashlight in there and then I close the box. Would I be able to carry that around and then open it later and still have light in it? And the answer is not quite because um, mirrors are a little bit inefficient and light travels so fast it would get absorbed by the air um, over its course of many kilometers bouncing back and forth inside the box. But a similar principle to this light in a box full of mirrors is actually how we measure gas concentration. So we start with a laser, which is the same color as um, what the gas that we're trying to find is absorbing. So remember how the greenhouse gases are absorbing in the colors of light that the earth gives off. We can make lasers that are that same color. And each gas has a different color that's unique to it, so we can tune our laser to exactly match the color that that particular gas absorbs. And then we shine it into our box full of mirrors, and a little bit of the uh, light will leak out one of the mirrors, and we can measure it with a detector. And the longer we have the light turned on, the more light kind of builds up in that box, and so we can measure that brightness over time. And then once we turn the laser off, um, over time, the brightness of light in that box will decrease as the light is getting absorbed by the gas in that box. And we can measure how long does it take for that to happen. And if we have more gas absorbing light more quickly in the box, we end up with a shorter time. So this is the state of the art for how we can measure how much nitrous, nitrous oxide is in the atmosphere. It's really precise um, and you can find really low concentrations. Um, also, the tools that are made to do this cost on the order of $100,000. So it's a uh, pretty fancy technology. But I'm working with some environmental scientists who have these tools and they have a field site uh, out in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta, which is um, used for agricultural purposes today. It's, it's an interesting site for a lot of reasons, but um, right now there's a, a farmer that's growing corn on this land. Um, here's the field site. So this on the, um, on the right is a gas flux measurement chamber. So what it is, is this um, this little sort of bucket will sit down on the soil and trap any of the gas that's coming out of the soil. Um, so there it is closed. And then these tubes leading out will take the gas that's coming out of the soil um, all the way to this large blue box, which has that laser-based gas analyzer in it. Um, and also a portable air conditioning unit and all these things to help keep that really fancy piece of equipment alive. 
out in the 100 degree blazing hot sun in the Central Valley in July. Um, and this is how they're studying nitrous oxide production from agricultural lands in real time. And they've gotten some really cool data from this. Um, some of the key results are that um, the main production happens at only at certain times and only in certain locations in the field. And which places are giving off nitrous oxide in the field are not the same every year. So it's this really highly variable um, lack of a pattern, I guess, that they're seeing from, from nitrous oxide. And so there's a lot of work to do to figure out um, why is it happening like this and what are the set of factors that cause big spikes in production. And for this particular field site, um, we've been able to identify some factors. So this is that same plot of how much nitrous oxide there is over uh, about a, a year's time span. And we can also measure nitrates, so that's one of the compounds in fertilizer. And we see that where the nitrous oxide spike, there was also a spike of um, nitrate. Also measuring water and oxygen in the soil, we see that um, having a lot of water and not very much oxygen, all of these three things together seems to combine to give us a big nitrous oxide spike. And it turns out that it's much, much easier to measure nitrous oxide, soil moisture, and oxygen than it is to directly measure nitrous oxide, which is where my um, sensors group comes in. So here we have our field that has different concentrations of oxygen, water, and nitrate, and then different amounts of nitrous oxide. And it would be very hard and very expensive to measure the nitrous oxide directly. So our vision is to make um, sensors to measure what's going on in the soil. And then we can collect all that data and put it into some equations in a computer and calculate how much nitrous oxide we expect to come out based on what's going on in the soil. So each of these sensors, each of these states would have a whole bunch of different kinds of sensors. And these sensors already exist. You can go out and buy an oxygen sensor, a moisture sensor, a nitrate sensor. They cost something like a hundred to a thousand dollars, which is still way less than the hundred thousand dollar laser based instrument. But if you were a farmer, say, trying to understand what's going on in your field, and you needed a hundred of these spread throughout the field to figure out which corner is hot, this is still unreasonably expensive, um, which is why. Uh, my group, which is a printed electronics group, is coming up with a um, more streamlined, integrated, and efficient way to make all these different sensors. So we use techniques like uh, inkjet printing, which is like an old school office printer where you have uh, ink in a cartridge and it scans across and it drops the ink in different places. Or uh, screen printing, which is like how you put a pattern on a t-shirt, you have a predefined uh, silk screen stencil, and then you can print different colors through the openings in that. So we use similar process, but instead of having colored inks, uh, we have we can have a material that's sensitive to nitrate, and we can print that. We can have a material that's sensitive to temperature, and we can print that. Or we have a material that's sensitive to oxygen, and print that. Um, so what we're working on is making this integrated sensor system with all these different uh, kinds of sensors that then can go out in the field, measure what's going on in the soil, and we can calculate uh, how much nitrous oxide is being emitted that way. And with all that information, um, it's knowing more about the situation is kind of the first step to making it better. So if we know what's going on in the soil and how that leads to nitrous oxide emissions, um, we can help farmers better manage their soil and avoid those big emission events. So if you know that conditions are ripe for big nitrous oxide emission, maybe don't fertilize today. Maybe wait for it to dry out a little bit um, before you fertilize. Those kinds of things which would improve uh, fertilizer use efficiency. So you could buy less fertilizer um, and then also reduce the greenhouse gas contribution of agriculture. 
And this is uh, science is a team sport. We've got folks in electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, environmental science, and across universities all working together on this uh, these larger projects. For Karen. Are, are the sensors out there being used by um, by any of the farmers? And I'm wondering how the receptive they are to. So not yet. Um, we the sensors are still very much in development at this stage. So we've got we went out and like tested for a couple days in July. One of our big challenges right now is um, stability, getting them to, to last over time. So that's still kind of a work in progress. We have had a number of conversations with folks in different, growing different crops and in different geographies about how useful would this be if this existed. Um, and kind of mixed results, right? Some people are fast adopters of technology, others um, less so. I think for the farmer, the main benefit would be improved fertilizer use, which has a whole host of benefits. You have to make less fertilizer, you have to buy less fertilizer, you waste less fertilizer. Um, so that there's been quite a lot of interest in, in that. But um, actually, as Kelsey was getting at, when you develop technology, you have the academic research phase. And then it takes a while for that to become a like commercially viable product. And we're not there yet with these sensors. I'll also take the opportunity as a host again to ask another to, to ask questions. Um, so I'm very curious about that graph that you were showing with the big spike of nitrous oxide around in like October or so. Yeah. And you're talking about how, so it is a yearly phenomenon, but not always the same place. Right. And, and so, um, I guess my question is, um, so like, what kind of what what are the like initial ideas of why that's kind of like still a yearly thing but different places yeah so part of this particular site goes through it its unique character so it's in the delta which is drained um, for crops and then flooded during the winter and um, it's migratory bird habitat and it yeah it's like the whole soil is submerged. So when this big tank drop in oxygen and increase in water, that's when they start the flood um, for the winter. And that is correlated to this big spike in emissions. Um, you can see that in the summer when there's a spike in nitrate, this chemical, but the water and oxygen are still in their summer zone. We don't have the same kind of big spike in emissions. Um, it's really when this this flooding event is happening. So that's something that's kind of unique to the Delta and other geographies that don't spend the winter flooding flooded have uh, different drivers and, and different patterns. But one of the key things about our sensors is that we can be able to get more data from more spaces at more time and the environmental sciences that we're working with are really excited about that to be able to better unpack the answer to that question, like what's going on here? Um, because right now, like this uh, nitrate plot, they have to go out to the field, dig like with a shovel, some dirt, bring it back to the lab, do a bunch of analysis there. So they can only do that once every week. And so if you could get a measurement every hour instead of once a week, you could get a lot more resolution. What's going on and why is this happening? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
as to the device that you showed earlier that like we were getting the readings off of, is that something that like the farmers had set up or is that something that was at, you, oh, you said it was at like a research site? Is it? Yeah, so there is a farmer that manages this site and the university has some agreement with them. They allow this experiment station to be run on their field site. So then the, the researchers have to go and like take all the stuff out of the field before harvest, but while it's all just growing it. So. I was wondering if there's like any movement to try to like require farmers or someone to be like continuously like monitoring levels. So it'll be really interesting to see what shakes out with the new state law requiring companies to report eventually scope three emissions, which is their whole supply chain. So like if you're um, a processed food company and you're buying corn, you're gonna have to report your emissions from the corn that you grew, which is nearly impossible to actually measure right now. But with that new legislation, it will be really interesting to see if that does change how monitoring is done. Um, the other California specific example I know about is there's um, regulations about pollution in drinking water from nitrate, which is a chemical, also not really widely measured yet. So it's a bit tough to enforce the regulations, um, but we're also working on how we can adapt our nitrate sensors to help farmers meet those groundwater pollution regulations. Yeah. Hi. So did you pick or not me, but did, uh, did your group pick the delta for a reason since it's unusual compared to the rest of the Central Valley with this flooding that it goes through? Yeah, so partly it's a really well um it has a lot of instruments out there already. Uh, it's been a research site for a number of years, so we have really solid baseline data on what it's doing. And part of our research project is to put our new sensors out next to the old sensors and see do we get the same thing. Um, so having this site that there's already agreements with the farmer and there's already equipment out there is really helpful. And um, we also know that we're going to see big nitrous oxide fluxes. So having a test site where we know we'll see something is also helpful for developing that. If you're like trying to as the camera in a dark room, it's hard to know if the camera doesn't work or if the room is just dark. So, uh, yeah. so I wondered, um, so um, for methane and carbon dioxide, these kinds of tools exist already, or just, uh, or would they be of any use? I mean, I'm thinking um, of all those ranches. So yeah, see. so both of those gases you can also measure with the laser thing um, because they're concentrations are higher, you can actually have something that's a little bit more simple. So it's a, a, a bit more affordable to get really high quality concentration data for those two gases. Um, yeah. Um, I, <laughs> I think the the baseline fancy research site um, that we're working in does also measure CO2 and methane. And so in the, when we give a computer a, boat, a bunch of data about what's going on in the soil, they can also compare it to those other gases and see if there's correlations between our soil data and their gas data. And what will your, um, this uh, product look like? I mean, do they, put them on the ground or do they just go stick or they just go around with it or yeah the, the vision is something like this a, oh yeah box a stick where the sensors are in the soil and then up at the top would be the electronics that are needed to read oh, all these yeah. sensors as well as um wireless transmission so you can actually get the data from it I remember you talking about this before, um, and they have you have to put a whole bunch of these out there. Right? Mm -hmm. So, if, how much per acre? 
ballpark. One, twenty. Um, yeah, one per acre. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, then let's thank Carol and Kelsey once more. All right.